Hi, welcome everybody. Today's lesson is on the quantum model, and this is due to the scientists Schrodinger and de Broglie. But before we begin, please get out your problem books and take out pages 215, 216, and 217, because that's where you can take some notes as this PowerPoint goes on. So pause the video, go get your problem book, and then come right back. So before we go on to de Broglie and Schrodinger, let's review the Bohr model. So according to Bohr, electrons possess a ground state quantity of energy. And this energy increases as electrons move farther from the nucleus. So energy level one is closest to the nucleus, energy level two is a little farther, energy level three is a little farther, etc. And these electrons can absorb energy to go from a lower state to a higher state. And they can also do the reverse because they're not stable at these higher excited states. They can come back down, but when they come back down, they release energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation. And this is the lights that we saw on that cool station lab that we did the other day. The key factor to Bohr's model that we still believe in is that energy levels are quantized. Electrons have to be at set energy levels, one, two, three, and they're not stuck somewhere in between, like 1.34 energy level, 1.75 energy level. They can be at energy level one or two or three, etc. He also said, which we don't believe anymore, that electrons orbit the nucleus like planets orbit the sun. And we're gonna learn what they do according to de Broglie and Schrodinger. And this model actually was pretty accurate for hydrogen, but not so accurate for any other element. So, so what about de Broglie and Schrodinger? Well, de Broglie came around and said an astounding thing, and that is electrons are particles and waves. So instead of thinking about the rings that Bohr had and electrons, little dots moving around the rings, he said that electrons were actually like standing waves. And these waves had to go around the same kind of ring, except they must be in whole number ratios of the wavelength so that the ends of the wave would match up exactly. And that's why you had different energy levels because you had more wavelengths and they would have to be at a different distance if you added an extra wavelength. And so you can see that in the second picture over here that there has to be an exact wavelength distance in the ring itself. But that model didn't last very long either. Schrodinger came along and did agree that electrons are waves, but he did a whole bunch of mathematics. So see this equation here, a whole bunch of mathematics. You'll have to memorize that and plot. No, you won't have to memorize that. Um, but maybe when you're in college, you might do Schrodinger's equation. Um, but the mathematics from Schrodinger told us the most likely or most probable location of the electron, and that was called an orbital. So let's look at the quantum model even further. And as we said, Bohr's model of energy level, we still believe in. So that is the energy level one, two, three, but it gets a lot more complicated to th than that it's really divided into three different kind of categories. The first category is the energy level. And this is called in quantum model, the principal energy level. So fill that in, notice it's in red, that goes in the space on 215. So if you need to pause the video, go ahead and do so. But Bohr's orbitals are what the quantum model call principal energy levels. So energy level one, two, three, four, we still use and we call the principal energy levels. But the principal energy levels are further divided into what we call sublevels. And each sublevel has its own specific energy and its own specific shape. And the shape is calculated from those Schrodinger equations. And it's based on wave um, properties and motion. And now sublevels are further divided up. So we have principal energy levels, then we have sublevels, and then we have what we call orbitals. And orbitals are the most defined space. And an orbital is the probability map where you find an electron 90% of the time. 
So what does all of that mean? So glad you asked. What's an orbital? Well, an orbital is the mathematical region. We can't tell you exactly where the electron is, but it's probable location, which is about 90% probable that the electron is going to be in that orbital region. So let me give you an example. Here is the grass court at Wimbledon. And you can see some of the court has this brown grass. It kind of killed the grass there. So what do you think that tells me about the location of the tennis player? Think about that. Yes, if you thought about it, that tells me where the tennis players are most of the time. So they play a lot of baseline in professional tennis. All right, this is where they are most of the time. It does not tell me that the tennis player went two steps to the right and two steps to the left. It does not guarantee that the tennis player is in that region right now. In fact, they're not in that region that right now. It does tell me that most of the time the tennis players are going to be here. So if I took 100 snapshots of a game at Wimbledon, 90% of the time when I took my picture, the tennis player would be in those regions. Same thing with an electron orbital. The mathematics tells us that the electron is going to be in that region of space about 90% of the time. So what shapes are they in? If we go back here, it's kind of an odd shape if we thought of the nucleus as the net. So we have some uh, orbital here and an orbital here. This would be a tennis player orbital. What about the shape of an electron orbital? Well, they have different shapes based on what sublevel they are. So here we have the S sublevel. And as you can see from the picture, the S um, sublevel is spherical in shape. And you can see this darker region in the middle. That's because that's even a higher probability that it will be there and less and less as you see it fades out. And the S sublevel actually contains one orbital. This is the one orbital it contains. An electron is somewhere in this three-dimensional space most of the time. And it's not acting necessarily as a particle. It could be a wave, which means it could be in more than one location at a time because waves take up more than one location. And every energy level, energy level one has an S orbital, energy level two has an S orbital, energy level three has an S orbital, etc. And each of these orbitals can hold two electrons. So I just told you how many electrons can one orbital hold. Hopefully you remember that there can be two. So let me tell you why there can be two. Well, it's odd that electrons are near each other at all because electrons are both negative or all electrons are negative, so they should repel each other. So you, you would think that maybe an orbital should only hold one electron. So why can two electrons occupy the same space with each other? Well, that's because electrons are always moving and actually can think of them as spinning. And when electric charges spin, they create a magnetic field. And so if you have one electron spinning one direction, it creates a magnetic field, a north magnetic field. And if you have the, elect the other electron spinning the opposite way, it creates a south magnetic field. Well, hopefully you remember physics if you've had it. A north pole of a magnet of a magnet is attracted to the south pole. So now we have two forces going on. The electrons are repelling each other because they're both negatively charged, but there's also an attraction because one is the north pole and one is the south magnetic field, and those have an attraction. So two forces are at work, and that's why they kind of um, balance each other out. The repulsion of the negative charges, but the attraction due to the uh, magnetic fields. So two electrons are the maximum that can be because a third one would match either one of the two and it would be repelled both by the charge and by the magnetic field. And this is called the Pauli exclusion principle. And you might say, I can't find that. Those are things in red on page 215. Well, that's because I kind of skipped out of order. So turn to page 216 and write this down on the bottom of 216. There's spaces for it. Each individual orbital may hold a maximum of two electrons, and this is known as the Pauli exclusion principle. So now here it's where it goes even more strange. 
The next sublevel, besides the S sublevel, is called the P sublevel. And a P sublevel has three orbitals within it. And a P orbital is two lobed, P for parabolic. And each P orbital is equal size and shape and energy. And the, this means that an electron can go from one P orbital to the next and be at the same sublevel. And the only difference between the three P orbitals is their orientation in space. And the P sublevel does not exist in the first principal energy level. So there is a 1s orbital, but there is not a 1p orbital. The first time p orbitals are, exist are at the second energy level. And here they are. So let's go back and look at this. So here I have, here is one orbital. Notice it has two lobes, but this whole thing is considered one orbital. This is one orbital. This is one orbital. And they come in sets of three. And notice S's were one what we call lobe. P's have two lobes to them. And S's come in sets of one, and P's come in sets of three. So if you can have two electrons here, two electrons here, two electrons here, I can have six electrons all together in the P orbitals. Now I'm going to another program to show you the other PowerPoint showed the orbitals next to each other, but they're actually on top of each other. Well, let me show you here. So here I have the p orbitals. Those have the two lobes, okay? Those have the two lobes, and those have the two lobes, all right? But what happens if you put all three of them together? Notice the center is at the nucleus. So notice when I stack all three together, it approximates a sphere. So it's a division of space, each pair of electrons kind of get their own room. So two electrons get this room, two electrons get this room, and two electrons get this room. And together, the three p orbitals make up a sphere. Now let's look at the d sublevel, but our time is running a little short. So I'm going to end right now, and this will just be part one of a two-part series. So don't forget to watch part two, and we'll catch up with the D sublevel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you real soon.